Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 93 of UAB Green and Told, original release Monday, March 13th, 2023. This podcast allows us to share stories from members of the UAB community. Looking to listen into past episodes? Visit alumni.uab.edu slash greenandtold, Spotify, or the Apple Podcasts app. While there, leave a written review to help more alumni find us. I'm Greg Berry, a UAB alum and director of communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. On this episode of Green and Told, we welcome David Brassfield, CEO of NextSoft. David has been part of the computer science field for more than three decades. While he's a C-suite executive today, he'll explain that he was on the ground floor of the industry when it was, well, on the ground floor. So, you know, back in the day, jobs were posted in newspapers. So you could go to the newspaper and there's really not, you didn't see anything. You saw electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. You saw, you know, all these different, you know, degrees, it, there was not anything being listed for computer science because it was brand new. If you look at his resume, it would seem as though he's a job hopper going from one place to another in a short period of time. But he'll share why an extensive resume isn't necessarily a bad thing. I was a product guy. I was built as a product guy. I didn't know it when I first got started, but I was a product guy. Plus, he'll share how computer science has helped revolutionize the banking industry since creating his first product several decades ago. Back in the old days, they used to write checks and the checks would be sent back to you. Well, they had to film the checks. And I said, well, just think about it if we could put that on computer and if we could put all those checks on computer and they could do the research right there at the bank. A two-time recipient of the UAB Excellence in Business Top 25 Award, David Brassfield has helped create more than a couple companies throughout his career. The list is extensive. But David's UAB story starts before those Birmingham businesses began. It starts in the UK. Born in the US into a military family, he was British raised, moving closer to his mom's family in England while in elementary school. But he knew his journey would bring him back to the States. It was just a matter of where. As a military kid, you do. I mean, you always kind of think, you know, I'm going to go back to the United States at some point in time. Uh, and we went to, you know, I don't have a British accent, went to uh, military you know, schools there in England uh, with other military kids. So you kind of grow up, you know, earning to see football. And again, we were pre direct TV satellite. Yeah, oh, yeah. We, we, got, we got to watch a real to real tape on a projector and P class for football games once a month. Oh, wow. And it was after the military guys were watched it. We, it was sent to the, you know, to the high school and we got to watch that. So that was the only quote sports we, we were able to see uh, there in England. Otherwise it was soccer or, or you know, tennis or, you know, all the other sports that they play there, rugby. What part of Alabama was your dad from? Uh, right here in Birmingham. Okay. So, uh, yeah, he's born and raised in Birmingham. Uh, hopped in the military and traveled the world. I assume you were in, in England when you chose to come to UAB. Is that right? Or were you somewhere else militarily? We were kind of in transition. Okay. So we were moving back. My dad retired in Florida, uh, moving back to Florida and, and then hopped in, uh, you know, did, started looking, thinking about, well, where do I want to go? And UAB was the selection. You enrolled in 1980. You mentioned you wanted to do something in medicine. Yes. What else were you looking at in a school and why ultimately did UAB draw you in? Well, again, medical school had a really good reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just figured, you know, again, not knowing anything about the universities, I said, well, I'll start there, get my undergrad, and then hop right into uh, med school, uh, you know, after that. So once I, I, I got going in biology, chemistry, all the different things you have to do pre-med, uh, didn't really say, okay, that's really where I want to go. Uh, and they had this new deal called computer science. It was just coming out and actually took a chemistry course. It was called chemical problem solving with Fortran. And, and that's how I hopped into computer science was that's the first class I took. And I said, well, this is pretty interesting. And then started taking a few more courses, changed my major and you know, the rest is history. That's an extremely big pivot going from medicine to oh, yeah. computer sciences. 
what was the transition like? You know, what did you, you know, have to do really, to kind of catch up? It really was. I mean, you know, again, when you're pre med, you're taking all the introductory courses. So it's mathematics, you got calculus, all the different yep. science courses, all the different English courses. So really, you didn't miss anything, you know. So just that my major started later in my undergraduate career uh, in computer science. So all the undergrad stuff that, you know, you normally would take anyway uh, was, you know, I was taking those courses as, yeah, as well as hopping into the uh, computer science courses there towards the end. What was the end goal at that point? Because you, obviously you wanted to become a doctor, but then you shifted and you wanted to do something in computers. But what was that thing that you wanted to do? Even then, I wasn't 100% sure I wanted a computer science degree because it was. It was brand new. Uh, there was really nobody hiring people with computer science degrees. So, you know, back in the day, jobs were posted in newspapers. So you could go to the newspaper and there's really not, you didn't see anything. You saw electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. You saw, you know, all these different, you know, degrees. It, there was not anything being listed for computer science because it was brand new. Yeah. And I actually took a job there in Birmingham at the Federal Reserve Bank at night and I ran their computer systems. And, and again, I thought, I said, well, I'll get some experience to see you know, how that is. And that's when I really you know, said, yeah, this is what I want to do. What was the computer science program like in the College of Arts and Sciences? Because you know, today you can pick up a phone and you got a computer right there. Back then, it probably wasn't even close to being like that. It's changed. Yeah, technology in general changes you know, hourly, monthly, weekly, uh, you know, so it's changed a lot, but same concepts, you know, same logic, same, if you were good at mathematics, if you were good, you know, with logic, uh, you know, you, you would learn the different languages that you could write in and then use those languages to create, you know, different tools, solutions, products uh, to help, you know, if you're in healthcare with healthcare solutions, if you're in, which I selected banking, uh, banking solutions. Why banking? It was by chance that I was working at the Federal Reserve. Uh, okay. They had posted there at the university, at the computer science department, they needed somebody that had some computer experience. So I went down and started working with those guys and and just took that, tra you know, continued on after the uh, after I started working there. But was there something with the banking field that kind of drew you towards that? Because remember, you have this interest in medical going into UAB and you come out a different way. Yeah, and you, you look at, and that's a good question. Uh, you look at Birmingham in general. Uh, even back then, it was all healthcare, yeah. so everything was healthcare. You know, all the most of the hiring was healthcare. You had all the university hospitals. You had everything right there, and they those guys were looking for people with you know my expertise. I was working there at the Fed. I liked working. Yeah, you know, and again, when I when I exited, I interviewed back in the day. It was IBM, NCR, and a company called Unisys. Those were the Google, Amazons of the you know the time. And I, you know, you, you selected a box and said, okay, what 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 experience do you have? Mine was in banking since I'd worked there at the Fed, so that's how I went that route. What was UAB like in general? We talked a little bit about the program, but UAB itself in the mid early '80s, uh, what was the landscape like? You know, it's just getting started as really a full college. Uh, we hired a guy named Gene Barto. I went to the first basketball game. Uh, it was actually held downtown at the Civic Center because we didn't have a, an arena there on campus. So all that is just getting started. I mean, the, you know, the campus life, the campus outreach, you know, everything that was going on that, you know, completely is different today. Uh, it was just beginning. And so it wasn't, it was becoming more, less a city school where you just went to class and went home to more of a university. When you receive your bachelor's of science degree, what did you start doing first thing out of UAB? Was it still with the Federal Reserve Bank? So I left. I had left the Fed and actually went to work for a company called NCR, National Cash Register. And uh, again, that was one of the top firms at the time. And went into their banking, uh, yeah, section within their 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 company and started writing software for them for banks. How long did you work in the banking field then? So I've been in the banking field, yeah, since '84. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, never got out of it. Never changed. Uh, really stayed in that. Yeah. You know, stayed in this environment all the way through to, to even today. Uh, when I worked at NCR, systems, small systems were just coming about. So okay. before you had these big, massive computer systems. So, for example, there at UAB, they had a massive IBM system, and what they did was they would you would share time on that system as a student 
as a professor or researcher, you you got a segment of time on that big, big computer that they had there on uh, 8th Avenue. And today it started switching probably in the late 80s to laptops, to, you know, small tabletop desktop computers. Microsoft had just come out. They had their desktop. Apple put out their desktop. And so the transition had started to, you know, decentralize computer systems. And with that, with, you know, you could start thinking about all the different applications that were not there then that you could start using in these smaller, less expensive devices. So the barrier back in those days to entry to the computer field was you had to have access to one of those big IBM systems or one of those big NCR systems. And, you know, that could cost you, if you bought your own, they didn't have AWS or the cloud or anything that we see today. If you bought your own, you, you're, you're looking at, you know, half a million, you know, $500 million or plus for a system. So that's pretty much well our barrier for most people to get into the business. Um, that, of course, changed when the smaller mini systems started coming out. And, and that's what NCR, IBM and all the different players, that's what they were doing. They're selling these smaller systems to banks, healthcare providers, uh, you know, a variety of, you know, industries. And that's where we got started writing software, you know, on those smaller systems. And then that, you know, again, has changed since then. Is went from the smaller systems now to the cloud where, you know, you can, in essence, it's kind of like going back to the old times where you had these big, massive systems and it's very inexpensive to, uh, to, to, to build, you know, software solutions today. If somebody would sit down and just look at a, a resume for David Brasfield, they go through and go, man, this guy's bounced around a lot, but that's not the case because you've done a lot of things, but you've also kind of parlayed it into new companies, new ventures, new chant, new, new opportunities. Was that something that just kind of came about and you wanted to embrace or how did that start? You know, I look back in time, I think I was, I was a product guy. I was built as a product guy. I didn't know it when I first got started, but I was a product guy. So I could figure out interesting niches within banking that was coming about. So for example, we were on campus at UAB in the incubator. So the incubator used to be right there where the, I think it's the chemistry building today or engineering building today, but it, it was there. That's where it started. We were one of the first software companies to go in there. And what we had built, what I had built was a solution back in the old days, they had this thing called microfilm. So they would film everything. You go to the library and you look up an old newspaper, you have to go to microfilm and look it up. Well, banks did the same thing. So back in the old days that you used to write checks and the checks would be sent back to you. Well, they had to film the checks. And I said, well, just think about it. If we could put that on computer and if we could put all those checks on computer and they could do the research right there at the bank and then you could have access to your own check. So that was the very first system we built was this check imaging system. And given the capability uh, for the bank to do their own research, to store their own documents and checks on site. And that was a hit. I mean, it, in essence, over a five year period, they stopped sending checks back and they used our systems and the patents that we had out there for that technology uh, to get that out. So that was the first product set that we put to market. And then after that, we had others. We had internet banking, uh, you know, today, digital banking, you got your phone. We built a digital banking platform and we were one of the first to actually offer it. We took it public and built that product where again, now you don't have to go to the bank. You can do everything off your mobile phone and, you know, bank uh, directly off it and look at again, where it's at today. Uh, you know, pretty much, well, most young people don't have never walked into a bank, yeah, you because know, everything's done remotely via the internet or your mobile. Uh, so we, you know, we built systems like that. So th those are the things; those are the niches that we looked at uh, and built products and services. And what we would do is we build a product, build a big base of clients, big company would come in and say, "Look, we need that product, we need that solution, we need those services. Can we buy your company?" And that's why you see again on my resume multiple companies because we built multiple companies, uh, you know, not really to be sold, but, you know, again, building cool products, cool solutions, and then they would get bought by these larger entities. And that's got to be a humbling experience to go through the entire process, building out the products, and then having a company approach you to say, you know what, we want to buy you out, knowing that you created something, you and your team, that has 
a long lasting effect. Absolutely. It's been fun. I mean, that's, that's the fun thing about it. And it's always changing. It's always, you know, you know, again, and bits and pieces get plugged into it. Like we, we saw security become a bigger issue uh, in the last five years. So we built a security, you know, entity and we built products and solutions around security again, not just for banks, but for really for general purpose for any type of, uh, you know, company or service out there. So that that's been fun where you can sit back and look and say, okay, here's the opportunities. Here's where it's going. Uh, we watch the compliance rules, regulations, and follow you know any of those guidelines for building new products as well. Over the course of your career, how many products do you think that you have established? It's been a bunch. Uh, my guess is probably in the 50 plus neighborhood of new products and solutions. And then you look at each of those products, they've got outspurts, you know, from those probably another 50. Uh, cause you know, once you build, you know, one solution, you know, a good example is internet banking. Yeah. We, the first internet, the true first internet bank we had was the picture of a CEO picture of his bank and the hours for the bank. That was all the, so when you oh, pulled wow. them up, that was it because they said, man, we don't trust this thing called the internet. We're not going to put our customers out there on the internet. And that was, yeah, that was internet 101. And then we took that and built in deposits and built in where you could pull up your accounts we built you know a variety of uh you know systems that could attach we actually had voice systems so where you can call your bank and get your balance you know uh from you know from from any phone system yeah it was one of our early products that we built into that digital banking platform so uh but yeah when you start looking at it and all the different off you know shoots of what you can do with products and solutions it's probably been at least 50 plus more since you have been in the tech side of the banking industry for you know several decades, how has that industry changed? It's consolidated. So you see, you know, you look at Birmingham. So Birmingham, also too, back in those eighties, we were actually one of the largest banking hubs in the United States because you had AmSouth, South Trust, Regions. Yeah, you, know, you had all these really large institutions downtown, and over time, they've consolidated, got bought up bigger banks. And same with community banks. Today, there's still about 10,000 banks and credit unions across the United States. And like I said, you remember I told you the very first product was that check imaging storage product. Mm -hmm. So that was done 25 years ago. 25 years ago, when we built that product, I remember somebody telling me that, well, there are not going to be any checks. So why did you build this product? And 25 years later, there's just as many checks being written today in the United States as there were 25 years ago. So, yeah, solution wise, they, they, they kind of stand the time, but, you know, from a market standpoint, yeah, there's been consolidation, but still, if you look at the U.S. in general, there's still a bank in almost every little city you can think of. So if you're from a small town, you know, if you're from Talladega or Silicaga, you know, Muscle Shoals, there's a community bank in those, those areas and they need the same technology as regions or any of the larger institutions. What kind of things are you working on now for the banking industry that's going to help improve it? So what's happened is, again, with the uh, AWS and the cloud, Microsoft Cloud and all the different things, what you're, you're seeing, there's a lot more new products coming to market. So there's a lot of new what we call fintech companies that are coming about wanting to do business with these institutions. Because if you think about it, the banks still have all the money. You know, they have all the accounts they have, you know, there's not very few people out there that don't bank somewhere, you know, either with a credit union or a bank. And what we have built is APIs into those systems. So if you have a new product and you want to c connect it into any bank in the United States, you would come to our new, co our company that we have today and connect, we, we can actually connect you to any institution in the United States. Because we've been doing it for a long time. We know how, you know, all these systems talk. We know all the different back end systems work. So we're able to do that. So that's that's one area that we've we've spent some time on. The other is security. We spent a lot of time here in the last, you know, several years uh, just on security. When you develop a product, does is it just something that you see a need so you want to fill it? Or are you approached by different banks that say, you know what, we think this might be a good product for us to help the company and then others fall in line. It's it's both. I mean, you know, you, you look at the market, a lot of times it's driven by uh, compliance, you know, legal things that come out, you know, things that happen that they, you know, mandate that a bank has to do something new, you know, so you can build products and solutions around that. 
Uh, sometimes it's just with, you know, what's going on in time. You know, like I said, it wasn't three or four years ago that banks wouldn't put their data in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So they wanted still to have, you know, control security with it somewhere stored in their back room or in, in a data center type environment. So here lately, you know, the regulators said, yeah, you can, you, you can use the cloud. So everybody's starting to migrate to the cloud and, you know, putting all the data in the cloud, which makes it a lot more economical, still secure, still, you know, has all the security pieces to it. So it just depends on the time. And, you know, when you look at products and solutions uh, and where things are going, uh, you know, for example, I would say today there's a lot of activity in climate, you know, what what's going on, you know, politically and, you know, just from an, in a general course, you know, what's going to go on. So I think there'll be opportunities in that space. Uh, moving forward, you know, both with, you say, well, how would that affect a bank? Well, again, it, it does based on the customers that they, you know, service and, and support. And again, if a regulatory issues come out where they have to, you know, track that and mandate that. Today, you're the CEO of Nexsoft, um, the latest company. How many companies have you been a part of? Probably seven, seven total. And how long on average are you a part of them before three to five years on yeah. average so you look at it you know if you again have been in it 30 plus years you know three to five years is on on average so you're on the cusp of that three to five years right now with nexoff we are what's next for nexoff yeah i don't know that's a good question um yeah again we, we're excited about what we're doing we're excited about you know we, we have thousands of institutions that use our products today uh you know and again i think the thing that we've learned is it's not just technology, but it's also having the ability to sell the technology, you know, to these institutions uh, and a knowledge of what their needs are and, you know, who they are. And, you know, it's just like any type of relationship. You know, we built those relationships over all these years, building products and solutions for these, you know, for these institutions. Looking over the quarter of a century since that first product that you developed for the checks, how has UAB helped you? kind of get the success that you've been able to enjoy? Yeah, you know, that's a good question too. I think the first is just having access to the students that are graduating, you know, in not just the computer science department, but the engineering department and other departments as well. Um, having that access, uh, you know, if you look at the, the department as a whole, they just had an anniversary where I forget how many new students they've, they've put on board, but it's a lot, like in the thousands. Uh, where if you go back in the 84, we probably had a graduating class of maybe, you know, 20. Uh, it's a very small class, you know, from, from that. So that's one has helped from that standpoint. Uh, and it's not just with our company, it's with all the companies. If you look at Birmingham in general, the growth through the incubators and the companies that have, you know, grown out of Birmingham, uh, having access to AB has been a great benefit, you know, from a, just from a national standpoint and educational standpoint. You've remained connected to the university. A lot of people, they graduate, they find success. They just, you know, forget about things. Why is it important to still have that connection back to your alma mater? You know, part of it is just kind of keeping up. You know, it's kind of like everything else. You know, everything else is changing. Banking's changing. Technology's changing. Well, education's changing as well. So I think you need to stay connected to the university systems uh, in that seeing what they're working on, where they're moving to, you know, just the degree programs that are being offered. Uh, and you see the very successful universities forging, you know, ahead with the newer technology models. You know, again, I'm focused on technology, you know, so that that's my interest. But I'm sure it's the same case in all the other departments there at the university. But, you know, there in the National Science and Mathematics, my interest is, you know, pretty much well computer science. That's David Brassfield. David earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Computer and Information Sciences from the College of Arts and Sciences in 1984. Over the years, he has founded and served as CEO of many companies, the latest being Nextsoft. David and his wife Phyllis have stayed engaged to UAB. In 2006, they created the David W. Brassfield Scholarship Fund, and just last October, they established the Phyllis and David Brassfield Endowed Faculty Scholar in Computer Science. As a connected member of the UAB community, David has a great idea of what it means to be a Blazer. Being now, I would say I'm from Birmingham and I'm a UAB Blazer due to the fact that you know, I've been there since 1984, you know, 
I don't know how many years that is, but a lot of years. And that, then just like I said, we've had our children graduate from UAB. We've had uh, two daughters graduate there. Um, and then a son get a master's degree there here just last year. So just from a connectivity standpoint with our family, UAB has become more of a family to us in that sense, that it's not just the Blazers, but it's part of our family. I'd like to invite you to listen to previous episodes of UAB Green and Told. Check us out at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Have a story to share or know someone we should get in touch with? Email greenandtold at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on social media. Search UAB Alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for listening. And until next time, go Blazers!